Good morning, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to call this work session of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to order. It's November 1st, 2018. The time is 9.30. With me today are Commissioner Emily Lindley and uh, from the General Counsel's Office, Tracy Gross and staff here to uh, present the matters that we're going to discuss today and look forward to this opportunity to having a, a more informal conversation, an informative conversation where we're not called to take any action. And uh, with that, I'll ask uh, Ms. Gross to begin the proceeding. Item number one is discussion of the Municipal Solid Waste Permitting Program. Uh, following the ED's initial presentation <coughs> and initial exchange between the ED and the commissioners, the commission will receive comments from the public on the topics posted in, uh, for item number one, with the exception of comments on pending permit matters or other contested cases which are subject to the ex parte prohibition found in Texas Government Code Section 2001.016. In the interest of time, speakers will be limited to three minutes each. Uh, good morning. My name is Toby Baker, uh, Executive Director of TCEQ. And um, the reason why I wanted to bring up municipal solid waste today it really comes from a number of reasons starting with some of the decisions that we made in my former role um, then overlay the I think the legislative interest that we've seen here recently and the public interest that uh, that we've seen and so um, I feel like uh, it's it may be time to sort of take a look at our permitting program and see if there are things that might need to be changed going down the road. And so the way I view today is sort of uh, a, a way to lay the foundation for that discussion. And so what I thought we do is have Earl sort of just kind of provide a municipal solid waste 101 for you guys uh, because there's a lot to it. And, uh, and so <clears throat> and Earl's done a, a great job and uh, representing us downtown. And uh, so I thought it'd be good for, for you guys to kind of hear currently where we are, and then maybe that will uh, that can uh, drive us forward with the discussion of if we're going to change things in the future. So with that, I'll I will stop, and I will let the true expert take over. Great. Thank you, Toby. Uh, good morning, commissioners, good morning. Yeah. general counsel, public interest counsel. My name is Earl Lott. I am the director of the Waste Permits Division, and I'm gonna be providing you with an overview of the Municipal Solid Waste Permitting Program today. Um, the primary function of the Municipal Solid Waste Permitting Program is to issue authorizations for the management, processing, and disposal of municipal solid waste facilities in Texas. The way we achieve that is through the issuance of permits, registrations, modifications, amendments, and notice of intent authorizations. Some examples of the types of facilities that we authorize include landfills, transfer stations, citizen collection stations, liquid waste processing facilities, um, medical waste facilities, composting mulch facilities, uh, as well as scrap tire and medical waste disposal processing. The program, program receives about 230 applications per year. We accomplish the review of these applications with a section of 32 full-time employees consisting of professional engineers, geologists, chemists, and a variety of other science-related backgrounds. Now, uh, for the remainder of my overview, I'm gonna focus primarily on municipal solid waste landfill permitting, since they seem to be the most high profile of the, the types of applications we receive and the uh, items that you probably hear most about. And uh, I'd like to start off by saying we maintain a very robust permitting process for uh, municipal site waste landfills. All applications go through a standard administrative and technical review. There's uh, two public notices. There's opportunity for a public meeting as well as opportunity for a contested case hearing. Uh, our staff reviews all applications to ensure that they are protective of human health and the environment. That is our top mission in, during our technical review. Um, all permits are reviewed under the oversight of a professional engineer and geologist. And uh, just to kind of give an overview of what a municipal solid per waste permit for a landfill entails, when we receive it, it's about six large three-ring binders of information. 
In order for an applicant to successfully demonstrate they meet the requirements for a permit, they have to address over 800 independent rural citations. And there are four parts to an application. Part one is basically owner operator information. Part two is the land use determination. Part three is actual site development plan and layout. And part four is the site operating plan. Um, one of the, uh, I guess, greatest challenges that our staff face when reviewing a municipal solid waste landfill permit was with that volume of information, just locating it in these applications. I mean, we go through thousands of pages just to identify where they've addressed these particular technical requirements. And prior to uh, a year ago, there was no standard form. All consultants have their own kind of way of putting these applications together. So anytime we have a challenge in finding how they've addressed a technical concern, we issue what's called a notice of deficiency. And that's how we communicate with an applicant and ask them to address a certain aspect of it. Uh, there is no statutory limit to the number of notices of deficiency that we send out, but I can tell you on a new landfill application that averages about three. However, if they go the bifurcated application route is where they submit only partial application, we typically double that number of uh, notice of deficiencies to about six. Um, The, uh, the next thing I want to focus on is that we do have a, in our rules, there's an outline for actually returning applications. If an application is just grossly deficient and we have worked with an applicant and they are non-responsive to our request, under Chapter 281 of our rules, we are allowed to return an application. Since 2008, we have returned eight applications. And... Uh, now, the next thing I'm going to focus on... Earl, do you know the breakdown on those? How many of those eight were um, new landfill permits versus two uh, other types of... Four. Okay, I had to look at my technical staff. Uh, I believe it was four of them, yeah. and that's a combination of arid exempt landfills probably. And appreciate that. So, okay. Uh, well, I'll continue on. The next thing I want to highlight is... Uh, you know, our program is always looking at ways to uh, streamline our processes and improve, def uh, pr improve efficiencies. Um, my staff have come up with a number of tools over the last couple of years to really help streamline that process and improve the transparency of the program. Uh, some of these tools that we're utilizing is mandatory pre-application meetings. We've always practiced pre-application meetings at this agency where prior to submitting an application, we ask the applicant to come in and discuss it with us. Um, We've pretty made that a mandatory process now in municipal solid waste. <laughs> and that allows the applicant to sit down with the actual technical reviewer and we can go through the most common deficiencies that we see with an application and hopefully uh, it will steer the applicant in the right direction to where they, won't, they can avoid those issues. The other thing that we've uh, developed and it's really become a very successful tool, I mentioned earlier, there's no standard format for putting these applications together and each consultant kind of has their own style of doing so. We've come up with an electronic checklist that's available on our agency website and it allows an applicant to select the specific type of application they are seeking. If it's a landfill, it'll pull up a custom template that has the 800 rural citations they need for a landfill. If it's a transfer station, it has a custom template for that. And that really just lays out a roadmap for applicants to see exactly what we're gonna look for and it also tells our staff exactly where in the application those specific, specific rule provisions have been addressed. That has really gone a long way in helping our reviews. Um, the other thing we've done is where applicable, we've developed standard application forms for portions of the application for the basic information. Um, with municipal solid waste landfill permits, we can't make an application form for the entire thing because there's just so many engineering reports and modeling data that goes into it. It's almost impossible to do a plug-in. Uh, the other thing we're doing is practicing in-process review of applications. Um, we've instructed our technical staff when they're looking at these applications, if an applicant has uh, a little minor deficiency with it, in other words, they submitted an incorrect map or the page number is incorrect, or there's a slight oversight in the application, rather than sending a notice of deficiency and allowing that applicant 30 days to respond to us, we will send them a quick email or pick up the phone and call them and have the consultant email that information to us. So that really has helped with streamlining. 
Um, the other thing we've done is we've we've developed a lot more guidance document for our specific technical issues uh, just so the public knows exactly what we're looking at when we're designing uh, uh, permitting these facilities uh, technical guidance documents for items like uh, drainage and landfill liner requirements and then uh, lastly uh, we're practicing simultaneous review when an application comes in it goes through an administrative review at the same time the administrative staff gets that application we assign it to a technical reviewer so they're doing a simultaneous review of this thing so once it's administratively complete we're putting pretty much ready to go out with any comments we have on the technical review um, those practices alone have helped us we've uh, estimated that we've reduced the number of notice of deficiency items that we send out by at least 40 percent and then um, the last thing I would like to highlight is table three in your backup material. And it talks about our permitting timeframes. Um, for our fiscal year 2018, with the implementation of some of these tools, uh, we have seen that 91% of the applications we received have been processed within our permitting timeframes. And uh, that concludes my uh, overview, and I will be happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you, Earl, appreciate that. Commissioner Lindley? Yeah, I just, have, I just have one or two quick questions. Um, one thing you've touched on, and I just kind of want you to clarify, and this can be for anyone, because I feel like sometimes um, the agency can be accused of holding the applicant's hand during the permitting process. I've heard that saying before. And when you talk about a pre-application meeting, I want you to describe that a little more, because I don't want it to come across as that we're holding an applicant's hand when they come in the front door and helping them get their permit through. I mean, at the end of the day, 91% is great, and it's MSW's job to issue permits. And so I want to continue that good work. But I just want you to speak to that a little, because I don't want it to um, sound like that's what those meeting is. Because I know it's more technical in nature. So I just want you to speak to that just a little to clarify. Right. Uh, very good <laughs> question. And we have heard that comment before as well. Uh, and to me, the pre-application meeting, uh, you know, it's a way for us to introduce the technical reviewer that is going to be assigned to this project, and it allows them to sit down with the applicant. And you know, we just talk about the the major milestones, the major items that we look for in an actual review, and it results in a better quality application for us to review. Um, so, it, and it ultimately saves staff resources because um, you know the timing issue. Um, you know, we also hear. Um, a lot of negative criticism about the notice of deficiency process and you know we're holding the applicant's hand but in my opinion a notice of deficiency is not necessarily a bad thing as I mentioned earlier it is our mission to ensure that that application is protective of human health in the environment and you know we're not going to determine it technically complete until they've checked all the boxes so uh, that's what we're aiming at is trying to get a better quality application right. rather than Holding I, the yeah, no, that's hand. great. Thank and you. And I, I hope that's I answered sweet. your question. I think so. Sorry, were you about to say something? Okay, sorry. Um, no, thank you. I appreciate that. I just kind of wanted to clarify it a little. Um, kind of the two other questions I have. Um, you know, you talked about eight applications being returned, and I don't expect you to have a number right now on this, but um, that doesn't consider all the people that withdraw their applications. Do you see a lot of that? I mean, that number is not captured anywhere, right? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner, um, there are applications at times, if, if we receive an application that is so grossly deficient, we cannot make heads or tails of it, and you know the applicant is non-responsive, uh, we will contact them and let them know, we're basically going to withdraw your application for you, and they usually comply with that. Uh, you know, it's withdrawal without prejudice. They have the ability to resubmit that application. Yeah, and that's not in that eight. Number. No, ma'am, that yeah. is not captured in the eight. Um, and the, the other question I had is kind of, um, I'm calling this a project, you know, uh, the improving the permitting process and um, streamlining things. So, and we might hear this from public comment, I don't know, but kind of what's the feedback? Um, I mean, obviously it's working well for y'all. You know, there's less NODs, feel like you're getting better applications through the process. Um, but I just kind of want to hear how it's, um, you know, how everything's going a little bit more on okay. staff side. Um, 
from the staff side, it's great. <laughs> I mentioned that there's 800 rule citations and there's not a standard format. Well, this is moving in the direction of standardization of an application and it ensures consistency amongst all permittees. Uh, the industry, from the industry perspective, I think applicants are liking it as well. Now, we went to a significant effort of uh, communicating with the, uh, the industry, letting them know as of uh, fiscal year, beginning of fiscal year 2019, I had to think about that, uh, we were going mandatory with these electronic forms. Prior to that, we've had these forms in, over the last two years, and it's kind of been a voluntary thing, but we just moved towards mandatory. Uh, and we had a lot of early compliers with that, and so all the feedback I've been getting is positive on that. Okay, one last question. Um, so, you know, that kind of covers the staff side. That kind of covers a little bit of the feedback from, I guess, the industry side. Um, as far as public education for everybody, how, how are you getting the word out? What's the feedback on that? Um, I mean, I'm sure you're pushing it out through your channels of communications through MISRAC or, you know, whatever it is. But um, what all have you done there? And is there anything we should be doing to help with that? Well, um as far as on the application side, um, you know, it, it's a it, it's an application requirement uh, that we've imposed. Um, we haven't done any media blasts as of yet on that. Um, I, and I wouldn't expect a media blast. <laughs> but uh, you know, as, as far as uh, public education, now I, I will say that is probably an area we can improve upon. And I have not had the opportunity to communicate with my executive management on this issue yet, but. Uh, I think we can do a better job of educating the public on the type of facilities we permit. And that being during our public meetings, uh, there's a lot of times where we get comments from applications, applicants, say uh, we receive a permit for a transfer station, while well, a lot of times the public doesn't even know what a transfer station is or a liquid waste processing facility. A lot of times when a notice comes out from waste permits, it's automatically assumed it's a landfill. So, uh, you know, if we can do a better job of educating on how these facilities operate and how they look, I think that would go a long way. So we've got some ideas in the hopper there. Thank you. Yeah, Earl, I was wondering what, beyond those measures that you've already identified, and you've heard the same criticism that I have, which I think is very valid, that these applications take an enormous amount of time in some cases, which is a tremendous burden not only on the applicant but on the community members who are understandably concerned about this facility these facilities and are exercising their right to to make sure that they do meet all the the public health and safety standards um, but in, in terms of what we can do to, to shorten those timelines ease the burden on on everyone do you have any other initiatives planned or these are fairly recent you're going to kind of see see what the uh, success rate is with these or what are okay. your thoughts on that? Uh, well, you know, the the streamlining measures that we've implemented, uh, I, I think they are definitely working. Uh, we're seeing the results of that. And I think to go any further with streamlining, it would require us opening our rules and, and changing some of those requirements. Um, but, you know, there's there are other aspects and uh things we can do to streamline the, the actual permitting process for landfills. Uh, there, we could develop more electronic permitting options for certain portions of it, uh, development of per, uh, permit by rules and standard permits for certain aspects of the application mm -hmm. when it's a standard design. And, and let me jump in real quick. One other thing we are looking at, and it's just not, we're not ready to present it yet, but I think we have to coordinate with 11, 11 other agencies. That is correct. Uh, whenever we get one of these permit applications in and so we're also looking at that process and how that coordination takes place um, <clears throat> and so we're trying to really get our hands around what's required by federal law what's required by state law and then if there's some ways to sort of uh, make that process more efficient as well we're just we're just not quite ready to present that yet okay and then in terms of recommendations about how we might amend our rules to improve the process or get a point where you have any ideas around around that um, you know I think one of the things we've talked about and, it, and it's very general and pretty simple is just some of the timing issues um, you know it, within the rule it, it sort of says you have to do this before you do this before you do this before you do this 
not all of that has, uh, there's oftentimes that doesn't necessarily lead to greater um, environmental protectiveness. Um, it's just, it's really just process for the sake of process. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we are looking at is really th what that looks like inside the rule. Are there things that we're requiring that don't really have an impact on public health or, or protection of the environment? It's really more of just a process issue. And so those little kind of what I would call, it's almost the low hanging fruit in my mind of some things we could change to, to help that process get, become more efficient. And Chairman, one thing I would like to add on the time frame piece. And now, uh, as I was mentioning, we receive about 230 applications in this program a year. And I would say the majority of them go through within the established time frames. There's probably a handful of the controversial ones that tend to really get bogged down in the process. And it's really a lot of, uh, they get hung up in district court or with those local approvals that uh, Toby was speaking of. Yeah, thanks, so. Earl. I appreciate that. And the <laughs> background material I was reading, the success you know, rate, 91% within the time frames, 95% if you, you know, if you don't consider those things that are beyond our control. I think it's the, the remaining 5% that we hear a lot about. Right. Um, well, yeah, thank you for that. Um, any, any thoughts from staff on w those cases where despite our best efforts, we issue a permit that we believe is protective of public health and the environment, and you do have a, a, an issue that's, that's challenging of a violation or nuisance condition that, that um, because, just because of the physics and engineering around it um, is difficult to, to solve. Is there any thoughts on what we can do? And I know this conversation is about, is about the permitting process and not enforcement. Is there any role for the permitting process um, in trying to address those um, situations? Well, I would say that we work closely with our uh, peers in Office of Compliance and Enforcement, uh, you know, during our permit reviews, and we give them an opportunity to, to weigh in on those permits. And if there are any conditions that they see on the site, uh, we are allowed to. We can do a, a staff-initiated amendment to a permit mm -hmm. to add certain conditions. So I think continued use of those tools would go a long way in helping with the compliance piece. And I'd also just point out, uh, this really isn't on the permitting side, but uh, you know, one of our exceptional items also provide, will provide extra FTEs uh, to provide more enforcement and more investigations on a more regular basis. So that's one of the one of the initiatives that we're taking downtown Great. this spring. Thank you. I would just offer that, and this is Stephanie, <clears throat> when we are writing the permit and we have a draft permit in any necessary coordination with the OCE, I mean, obviously, I say obviously, but the draft permit is written such with the technical requirements that if, it, if the permittee operates in accordance with the provisions, there shouldn't be any nuisance conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the flip side of having a of rules and permits is that you have to have the compliance. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's issues that arise subsequently um, that are more technical in nature, that's when I think you can have a conversation as between OCE and the permitting staff. Um, and it could be potentially through the technical requirements route. Appreciate that. Um, the only other observation I have is this, you know, the idea of the in-process um, deficiency review and the idea that y'all will just pick up the phone and try to solve these problems as they arise as opposed to um, creating a batch for an NOD and then um, putting those on a, a I guess at least a 30-day time clock maybe longer that's um, that sounds like a good development <laughs> I'll say Thank that um, other questions or comments no I would just um, I'm sure you'd agree but I know staff has had maybe over the past eight to ten years just some monster applications come in and I think y'all have handled a lot of difficult situations really well whether that's in the public's eye or just um, working the permits and so I just commend you to keep up the good work because I know it's been a lot yeah I echo that and Thank and you. yeoman's work downtown in the in the hearings as well Earl appreciate that um, 
Mr. McWhorter, do you have any observations you want to share? Um, I really have nothing uh, substantive to add, but I know my staff, we tend to see things, you know, when they get through this process, mainly that you're talking about, and, and, uh, and we also try to educate the public on the process and the reasons certain things happen the way that they do, but I do know that uh, in our work with uh, staff, and we do work with staff a lot on those more controversial applications that move through the process, we appreciate the work and the dedication and the time that's put into those things. And uh, all of the things that you've outlined in your backup materials, uh, you know, as far as creating efficiencies in the process, I, you know, see that, you know, that you're doing that first and foremost with the understanding that the applicant is still uh, charged with protecting human health and the environment. And I'm all for efficiencies in the process as long as we continue to meet those goals. So thank you. Thanks. Um, at this point, I thought maybe we'd open it up to public comment, and I think we have a few people signed in. And so, you know, again, I'll ask that the um, comments made be germane to the, to the topic, MSW permitting, and that we not talk about particular permitting or uh, enforcement actions, as that would create ex parte uh, communications issues. And uh, first up, I'd like to invite Ms. Coombs uh, to the podium. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and Ms. Coombs, before you get started, I think we're limiting comments to, to three minutes, if you can keep it to that. And uh, if you'll state your I, name uh, and any affiliation for the record. Um, my name is Barbara Coombs. I have a, a sole proprietorship environmental benchmarking. My background is that. A little light should oh, light up. Oh, sorry. There we go. I can hear um, you now. <laughs> I, I uh, was a recycling coordinator for the city of San Jose, California in the mid-90s, and uh, without mandating, we got to, I facilitated in getting that city to a 64% recycling rate. What I'm wanting to just share with you is the concept of reducing the demand for permits through... Um, Two, two ideas. One is um, a concept that was used in the 80s through the utility industry to defer the capital cost of opening, uh, in their case, a utility, but in our case, it would be a landfill. And they helped uh, increase uh, energy conservation with caulking and insulation. And everybody remembers that. And I'm, I keep thinking that this has application for landfills in that if the more we promote recycling, and I really don't like focusing on recycling, I like focusing on waste diversion of, or waste uh, reduction, and um, that that would extend the life of the landfill and whatever can be done in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thought is um, that I feel like there's some erroneous pressure being made to count recyclables, and it's out of the landfill, it's, it's, it should be out of sight, out of mind. It's, we need to focus on what's in the landfill, mattresses and food waste. Um, and the counting of the recyclables, it's like where does it end because there's so many different categories. So I would really love to see a focus on a simple number, which is garbage per capita. And it's easy to identify. Um, we've got that number. We got the population in each city. We've got the tonnage that's coming into each landfill. We don't need to measure all the recyclables, even according to Retract's own conference in Tennessee. I'm sorry, I get nervous. A couple that's of right. months ago, they agreed and, and they concurred with the audience that said, this data is four years old by the time the EPA publishes it. it it's really pointless. Any industry that's going to start a company Using that feedstock of recyclables is not going to use that data. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your comments. I think I'm recalling some of the same, um, the, the, the Frank Zappa commercial maybe for the utilities. For those of you who are too young or you didn't see it, <laughs> Frank Zappa made a, a uh, television spot, and this is, this is decades ago, for the utilities. 
and he said, I, I would, I'm surprised that I'm making a commercial for the utilities, but his message was all about conservation. The only reason I'm doing it is it about, it's about conservation. So yeah. appreciate that. Um, let's see, the next, uh, uh, Andrew Dobbs. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Commissioners. Congratulations on getting the chair and on Thank your appointment you. to the Commission here, and welcome to everybody on staff here as well. Um, I'm Andrew Dobbs. I'm the Legislative Director with Texas Campaign for the Environment. Um, and obviously we've been one of the groups that's been very critical of the process to date. Um, you know, I think that there's several different things going on here, um, but one, the, I think if we can just sum it up, it's this, it's that a lot of, if, if, if right now, if we have a process that's intended to prevent nuisance concerns and that's supposed to protect Texas property owners, their families and the environment, right? And people on the other end of this process, after they get through it, are still facing nuisances and still and feel like their property and their interests have not been protected. Then there's something insufficient with the current process, right? And that and that begs the question of what are we going to focus on about fixing this? How can we make sure that we get through this process so that those five percent of cases that are taking up, you know, forty percent of the time in this agency, or however much it is. Um, maybe more, maybe less, but they're taking up a disproportionate period of time. How do we minimize those? How do we eliminate those so that we can make sure that we're getting through these processes more effectively? Um, there are a lot of different ideas about that that we could look at. I think that one of them is like a kind of fu fundamental idea here is that, you know, the idea that the agency exists to issue permits and not as an independent arbiter and enforcer of Texas laws. Right. It feels right now in the way that there's in the way that we hear a lot of this is that applicants get most of the focus. In fact, we heard a lot about applicants. We heard a lot about the application process. We heard very little about protestants and, the, and, and their rights and interests in this process just now. Um, and I think that that's something that we have to consider as well. You know, with regard to notices of deficiency, um, we're glad to hear that the process has gotten more effective, um, and that's great. Um, but what we do know is that the notice of deficiency, that, that it's not just technical oversights are missing the paperwork or whatever. There are instances where there are substantive requirements under the law that are not being met and that are going through the process being unmet. Right, And then at the end, we're getting these special conditions where people are getting a draft permit or getting a permit, right, while, while still not being fully in compliance with the law. You know, at the hearing that we had in September at the, at the State Senate, you know, there was a point when one of the industry representatives said, you know, if we meet all the requirements of the law, then we should get our permit. That's absolutely true. But if they're not meeting all the requirements of the law, then they shouldn't get a permit. Um, and, that, and we should be willing to see those things uh, return to them and the process, uh, you know, in, in the process done in that way. Because I think if that happens, you get stronger, more robust uh, applications in the first place. Um, you know, and in terms of like, you know, this idea that, well, you know, it's just the pagination or whatever, you know, there are sections, like if you look at 337.57.59.61, 63 and 65, right? Those are the, that's where it outlines the parts of an application, right? And also, and then 6, 7 is to do with uh, property ownership. Those seem like the substantive portions that if those are deficient, that's what we're concerned about. If you look in earlier that's three portions, minutes. Okay. Just ask you to wrap it up. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, there's a lot of other things I could talk about. You've heard my testimony in other forums. We'll be talking more. You'll see letters and whatnot. But, you know, obviously, you know, we are, we're reserving our concerns and just stating those for the record. Thanks for being here. Appreciate your Thank comments. You. Can I just make one comment, Chairman? Sure. I just want to, I want to be clear so, so that you hear that the, the rights of the protestants are absolutely front and center on my mind as we begin this process. One of the reasons I'm really looking at this is not about um, it's really about staff resources and using state resources in a responsible manner. And when I look at the amount of time and what we're, what we're asking Earl's team to do, it's, it's really the question of how do we maximize, how do we maximize the efficiency with each dollar that this agency is spending in a way that keeps the, that keeps the protestants in mind, but also the applicants, because I think they're both, both are, are, are our constituents here. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's wanting to be, um, 
responsible with those state dollars that we're spending and can we do that in the best way that that we can so okay. and fees that. larger than 150 dollars might be a, a key answer to that question thank you thanks all right next we have um robin schneider Hi, my name is Robin Schneider with Texas Campaign for the Environment. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I've been working on landfill permitting and enforcement since about 2001. Uh, and so I've seen a lot um, before uh, most of you here have uh, been at this agency. There's uh, some critical instances, clear instances of bad faith on the part of this industry, uh, the agency that you should know about because you're new to the agency. Um, back about 2005, the agency's government relations person slipped in a provision at the end of a session to take away the mandatory meetings of new landfills. The, the author of the bill admitted it was that person, uh, got in at the end on an unrelated bill, and passed. So you have these clear instances of the agency acting in bad faith. That provision was never debated. It was not in a separate bill. So that's some of the history that we come here with. Um, and even just now, when uh, Mr. Lott started, he said the issue is um, approving permits. The issue is approving and denying permits. That came up in the end. But at, from the beginning, that's the way this agency sees itself, and that's the way the public has come to realize. Uh, so that's a big problem. You heard the list of the, chemi the various chemists and blah, blah, blah that they have on staff. Uh, one big problem are these bifurcated permits that have the land, the, where you get land use compatibility. There are no urban planners that are looking at this. How are they supposed to make a determination on bifurcated permits without the expertise? Those bifurcated permits are used as a way to get the camel's nose under the tent so that local people cannot use their uh, uh, officials cannot pass siting ordinances and put landfills where they should be rather than where the applicant can find the land and buy the land, oftentimes in floodplains. So uh, that's another thing where we would like to see the rules change because we have these monster storms now. And our rules around uh, floodplains are, are not adequate to protect our environment and our water supplies. Uh, you've had a landfill, you've had waste facilities approved uh, between two rock quarries that had exposed the aquifer, a drinking water aquifer for thousands of people, and the agency approved that application. You've had applications approved over aquifers. You've had engineers uh, submit applications with grossly inaccurate information. And because it has that engineer stamp, your, your staff does not verify all that information. They don't even do a site visit for where a permit is supposed to be, a landfill or a waste facility is going to go. If you want to use the permitting process to deal with nuisances and other problems, have renewals. Reopen the rules. Have permit renewals like you have for other kinds of facilities. Why a transfer station doesn't have a permit renewal? That facility never fills up. That's what they say with landfills. That's you have a minutes. permit until it's filled up. I could go on and on, as I'm sure you're aware, but these are just a few of the examples of why the public does not have confidence in this agency and why the laws and the rules need substantial changes. Appreciate your comments. Sure. Uh, I think that's, oh, we have uh, one more signed in, uh, Mr. Sullivan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ray Sullivan. I represent a &B Cattle Company, which is a large landowner in South Texas, but I'm really here um, making comments on my own behalf uh, as someone who's been around state government for a long time and greatly appreciates the state's balanced approach to regulation. One of the things that I've noticed in this space, however, is that uh, landfill applicants do not get reviewed for criminal backgrounds, business backgrounds, other um, uh, character or business issues 
as long as those issues occur outside of the TCEQ. As I understand it, uh, Mr. Lott's division looks at a, an applicant's record of enforcement and engagement with TCEQ, but if they have a long arrest record, bankruptcies, maybe even a criminal record, those issues are not considered for an applicant for a waste permit. It seems to me that if it is this commission's and the state's interest in getting good quality applications, good quality applicants, that there should be a criminal background check, a business background check for landfill applicants in order to make sure the right people are in that business in the state and that the state really does have a balanced approach to safety and to the permitting process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Do we have anyone else signed in? No. Um, I'd ask staff if you all have any other comments or reactions or anything else you'd like to address on item one. No, I would, uh, you know, I, I would invite uh, Robin to set up a meeting. I'm happy to meet with her and, and hear some of her ideas about um, how to better uh, help protestants through the process as well. Uh, I don't want to come across as excluding, uh, you know, that half of our constituency. So, um, so I would offer that. And um, this, this is, I, I felt like this is informative. This is a great way to start the conversation. And um, I'll be probably meeting with you individually as we move forward. And, and if we come up with any ideas, good, bad, or in between. So thank you. Thanks, Earl. Appreciate that. Commissioner Lindley, anything else on item one? No, just thank you. We'll keep talking. Thank you. Item two is discussion of the legislative recommendations as proposed by the executive director. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning. Commissioners, uh, my name is Ryan Bice, Director of Communications and Government Relations, uh, to present our list of legislative recommendations for the 86th regular session. <clears throat> We're going to start off, um, you all should have the uh, chart in front of you all. We'll go through that. And if you all have any questions, just stop me as we move forward. Does that work? Uh, first is the uh, expedited processing for permanent applications. Um, this kind of would go hand-in-hand -hand with our LAR request, uh, but basically uh, would give statutory authority uh, to the agency for uh, uh, FTEs and also uh, specifically uh, uh, would, would, would go through, uh, also allow for, for uh, overtime pay for those FTEs uh, through statutory authority. Uh, right now, uh, we curr it currently states um, uh, other costs, and this would just kind of clarify that in statute. Um, this would help, you know, with the demand that we're seeing in there, and uh, I think there's a lot of public interest um, in this, um, a lot of stakeholder interest. And just to tag on to what Ryan is saying, but this is specifically for, for express authorities, how I think I would characterize it for um, the surcharge to be applied towards FTEs. Um, right now, we only apply the surcharge to the overtime for FTEs, whereas contractors are 100% surcharge. So that's um, kind of putting a little bit more specificity on the on the the discussion. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I guess we can take these one by one. Do you have any comments or questions on? Uh, I'm, I have a question too, but I'll defer to a few. If you yeah, no, go right ahead. Um, and mine are kind of a little bit. Um, about the program in general, so uh, if you're not the best answer, that's fine. Um, just to not. talk a little about expedite permitting, I don't want to go down, you know, big rabbit hole. We're here to talk about um, the legislative recommendations. Um, but you mentioned contract employees, and so these 10 FTEs would be for, um, do you want to talk about who the 10 are, what they're going to be doing? That kind of thing, and then, and I'll just go ahead and I kind of want to hear also the current situation of our contract employees. How many we have? Uh, it's my understanding we've had a, you know, 
one or two get better offers. And so I just want to hear about that um, and uh, really about where these 10 are going to be, what they're going to be doing. Clearly, Mike Wilson is up to the table. Yes. So thank you, Mike. I'll let Mike and Mike Steve. Have, and Stephen, thank you. Please I'll do let you not guys have at Mr. Haygood. Um, good morning, Chairman, Commissioner, General Counsel, Public Interest Counsel. My name is Mike Wilson. Thank you, Stephanie, um, Director of the Air Permits Division. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this a little bit this morning. And, and yes, historically, we have implemented the expedite program with the surcharges, funding the additional resources. Those have been with existing employee overtime. Um, we did have up to what I would call 2.5 contractors. We have a part-time to full-time. Um, in selecting those contractors, of course, there is always um, some good effort there. You have to find experienced contractors that understand how to work and review a permit and do that effectively, efficiently, and, and quickly, obviously, to be a part of that program. Uh, we did recently lose um, probably one of our most effective contractors. They did uh, receive a better offer elsewhere, which, you know, that's that's good for them but again it keeps some of the challenges going for us with the expedite program and, and moving permits effectively really across the board um, this proposal that we are talking about um, more recently with 10 potential FTEs that would be funded um, with surcharge money again I think fits the statute and, and what's been laid out there in the rider as far as using that surcharge for additional resources but it would be using um, FTEs basically and, and really to get those 10 FTEs again uh, there would be a lot of consideration in finding the correct 10 FTEs that have the ability to move a permit quickly and effectively and, and so those would have to most likely be experienced staff uh, potentially that have served with the near permits division previously or that perhaps are currently with the near permits con uh, division currently um, one of the other considerations that we've talked about if this were to be approved is you know if we shift 10 APD employees potentially to the review of these expedite projects, they're funded with surcharge, that gives us the ability to replace those and train up newer full-time employees as what we would call just regular employees. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, um, getting this piece of legislation potentially passed and getting our LAR through is really critical. And it's not just for expedited permitting. And we've talked a little about this, that this is going to benefit all air permits. And so, you know, those smaller to middle-sized guys, companies, whatever you want to call them, that um, submit applications and maybe can't cut as large of a surcharge check um, will still benefit from this. It's not just going to be all the people that can write a big check, for lack of a better term, um, that benefit from this. And so that's why I really... I really want to push this through. And that, and that is something I was just going to add to what Mike was saying, is that this is not a discontinuation of use of the surcharge um, in air permitting. It is a focus, and I think we've spent a lot of our conversation on major new source review, because that's where the big workload is. That's where we have a lot higher number of applications received than compared to prior years. Um, but this does not diminish expedited permitting that's available for minor new source review applications as well as Title V. Um, so that's a, I mean, it's an important point. You're good. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, Mr. McWhorter, any observations on this item? I don't have any right now. Thanks. Thank you. Next okay. up, Ryan. Next uh, uh, item on the list is the replacement of newspaper publications with web-based notice for uh, hearings of proposed air quality rules. Um, this would uh, eliminate uh, newspaper publications uh, uh, and will increase efficiency uh, in the process. And this is um, just regarding uh, air quality rules. Um, this wouldn't be regarding any air permits or anything like that. This is just, um, and most folks that do um, track this are on a email um, that's already been, that's already sent out to, the, to them um, on their subscription list. So. Folks that track this fairly closely already are going to be aware of when those rules are, are going to be published in the text register. And, and can you remind me if you know how how do you get on that list? I mean, it's it's of course open to anybody who wants to be on it. Is there a link on our website? There's, there's a there's yeah. a link on our website. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Appreciate that. No, I I had one question earlier on about this, and um, it was answered, and that was, um, will it affect federal? program delegation and it's my understanding it will not no. so 
That would right. be my only concern with it. Anything from you, Mr. Werder? No, I'm, no. I'm all in favor of going uh, more electronically over newspaper publication in, in many areas, but this is a good one. Great. I was thinking passenger pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> No. Okay. <laughs> That's moving the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. Item three. Uh, item three is uh, another proposal for, uh, this is for explicit waiver for uh, governmental and sovereign uh, immunity for state government subdivisions. And this comes uh, from a particular case uh, where um, uh, uh, the courts ruled that a uh, local government had sovereign immunity against uh, TCQ enforcement action. Um, that is currently still in the courts, but this would clearly state that um, we do have primacy in, in, in delegating uh, enforcement from the EPA. Yeah, and this is a really important <clears throat> one because um, congratulations to the lawyer who prevailed on this argument, but what it means for our programs is that if we issue a permit to a local government that, that we don't have a, the means of, an, of enforcement. You know, right. um, and uh, you know we just can't conduct business that way. Um, so this this is certainly a critical one, Commissioner Lindley. Any questions or observations? Yeah, completely agree. Uh, Mr. McWhorter, I support it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Number four. Number four uh, is uh, Executive Director approval of uncontested district matters, and this is just streamlining uh, the process and and. and getting things uh, through a little bit faster here at the agency. And this would just, um, if it's an uncontested, uncontested district matter, uh, the ED uh, would have, uh, would be able to approve those. Um, and that would result in water district dissolution, district conversions, and that, uh, without holding a hearing with the commission. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense A lot me. of sense. Good government. Comments or questions from? I agree. Great. Thank you. Next, uh, notice and hearing exemption for certain water right amendments. Uh, uh, this would be a, a new Texas uh, water code subsection. Um, and this would, uh, uh, proposal would explicitly exempt certain water right permit amendment applications from any requirements regarding notice and hearings. And there's uh, only a, if, if they're moving a pump from uh, one part of the uh, property to another, um, minor, minor changes that do not affect downstream users or or uh, seniority uh, water rights or anything like that, then uh, it would be exempt from these type of hearings. And this is just another uh, case of us uh, trying to, uh, the agency trying to streamline the process and, and, and reduce cost. Great. Thoughts? I don't have, I, my only thought is, you know, I think um, this one we're gonna have to explain very carefully when we're out there talking about it because <laughs> I think people hear water right mm -hmm. and you're eliminating notice and it causes panic and you'll automatically hear people just say, that's a no-go. And so, you know, as long as we're very thorough and we're very um, upfront and explaining that this does not affect senior water rights or um, the environment, then, you know, I think, I think we can get people there, but I do think it's gonna be, we're just gonna have to be very upfront and awesome we explain that because as soon as you hear those terms, like I said, water right and getting rid of a notice, it will cause a little bit of panic. I agree with Commissioner Lindley. I think uh, reaching out and explaining uh, what is covered and what is not covered by that will be crucial with uh, the public stakeholders. Thanks, Thank you. <laughs> and that, that covers all the legislative recommendations. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Uh, any additional thoughts or comments on this? Um, we don't have anyone signed in on item two, so I think that brings us to the close of this meeting. I really appreciate all the staff's efforts. Um, and um, we will be meeting in, uh, in close session and um, we'll do that immediately following this meeting. The time is now 1025 and we are in recess.
The commission met in room 211S, building A for closed session from 10 25 to 10:30. No action was tank it taken. Um, they met pursuant to Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Section 551.074 on item 3B. They did not meet on items 3A, 3C, or 3D. The commission stands in adjournment, and it is 10:31.